Coming up from the lofty forests of Zambia to Mozambique's coastal plains, back-to-back -back climate events are killing corn crops and decimating pea fields. <laughs> Cacao fields are drying up in West Africa. One company says it's helping farmers to weather the storm. It's a great time to think about where our chocolate comes from and what conditions it's grown in. And one of South America's most dangerous insects is buzzing its way into homes and hospitals. Warm temperatures and flooding are providing the perfect conditions for mosquitoes to spread the dreaded dengue fever. <laughs> Just two degrees is on. Now. This will be uh, the, the worst dengue fever uh, season in the Americas. We've spoken extensively about dengue fever on this program. The mosquito spread illness is difficult to eradicate, especially in areas with hidden pools of fresh water where the insects lay their eggs. And there was a lot of stagnant water during the rainy season in Brazil, Paraguay, Argentina this year, as well as an uptick in extreme weather like storms and floods. The Americas recorded more than 3.5 million dengue cases during the region's wet season. Of those, more than 1,000 people died. What's also concerning is that Puerto Rico, for example, reported a public health emergency during its dry season Dengue cases don't usually spike during those months. The disease is a nasty one. It can cause horrible headaches, fever, vomiting. Severe cases can lead to hemorrhaging and death. Las causas medioambientales juegan un papel clave. El aumento de las temperaturas y la mayor frecuencia de eventos climáticos extremos, como olas de calor, sequías intensas, que llevan a la población a almacenar agua de forma inadecuada y tormentas o inundaciones pueden aumentar la proliferación del mosquito vector. La vacuna que tenemos disponible no es una vacuna que va a doblegar la epidemia de dengue. Debe ser usada en ese, en ese marco de complementariedad con las otras acciones, pero lo más importante sigue siendo las acciones de campo, las acciones de control del vector, de prevención, de educación. And a team of Argentine researchers have been investigating the biology and behavior of the Aedes aegypti. That's the mosquito species that transmits dengue and other viruses like Zika and chikungunya. Que lo que ha favorecido la abundancia de las poblaciones de Aedes aegypti es el fenómeno meteorológico del Niño que eh, está acompañado por abundantes lluvias, por abundantes precipitaciones y esto es lo que genera, eh, sabemos que Aedes aegypti está, digamos, sus poblaciones están afectadas por la temperatura, es un mosquito netamente tropical y subtropical, pero también por las precipitaciones. Entonces las temperaturas son adecuadas eh, para el desarrollo de este vector, pero el tema de las precipitaciones ha favorecido la inundación de distintos sitios de cría. Otro factor importante es eh, que el año pasado, en, eh, en invierno, también se eh, detectaron por primera vez casos autóctonos eh, de dengue en Argentina. Esto que significa que las poblaciones de Aedes aegypti estaban activas, eh, las hembras estaban picando y podían eh, transmitir el virus dengue. Es algo inusual y algo que no había ocurrido hasta el momento en Argentina y exclusivamente cuando está en una situación como en este momento está Argentina, eh, es de recomendación eh, el uso de las eh, fumigaciones para disminuir, voltear, se le llama, el número de eh, mosquitos adultos infectados. El dengue hay que tomarlo como una... Eh, situación regional, lo que ocurre también en la región luego va a repercutir en Argentina. No, hoy ya tenemos 150.000 casos de aquí que están generándose a través de la picadura de los mosquitos este, de las poblaciones locales de Argentina y tenemos más de eh, 100, eh, 100 casos de muertes. Eh, eh, si lo comparamos con el año anterior, la, los números son notoriamente mayores y aún nos falta un camino para recorrer. Nearly 50 million people in South and Central Africa are threatened by dengue fever and food insecurity. They don't have a regular supply of water or enough to eat. A drought that began in 2023 has made farming incredibly difficult. Malawi, Zambia and Zimbabwe have declared national disasters as severe dry conditions caused widespread crop failure. The UN says the region is experiencing overlapping crises of extreme weather between storms, floods, heat and drought. 
The blame is being laid on the El Nino climate phenomenon, which began last year and is expected to continue through to sometime between April and June. In the Mangwe district of southwestern Zimbabwe, dozens queue for rations of cooking oil, peas, and other foodstuffs provided by U.S. aid and the World Food Program as a crippling drought decimates the agricultural sector. The aid groups say 20 million people across South and Central Africa are on the brink of starvation. The dry spell even reached Botswana and Angola to the west, and Mozambique and Madagascar to the east. The lack of rain is linked to the El Nino weather pattern and has had a devastating impact during the region's peak agricultural season. Zimbabwe has been facing continuously drought uh, since the last year and certainly is a part of the global climate system because of the impact of El Nino. So Zimbabwe at the moment is really facing huge challenge and uh, then there's a worry that's above the crops failure. Uh, uh, there's a worry about more than two millions of people potentially will facing hunger uh, in the country. Zambia has lost one million hectares of the continent's staple corn crop, while officials in Malawi say 44% of its own corn crop failed. But this part of the world has been in the midst of an unforgiving weather cycle. Last year, this dry and barren land was inundated by deadly tropical storms and floods. The last time they can remember this type of drought is 1947. And so it's, this is not a normal circumstance. And they say this drought, now with this type of heat that they've experienced, is, has not happened before. The number of people needing life-saving aid continues to skyrocket. But there's little help in sight, as the World Food Program says a historic funding shortfall hinders their ability to deliver food like rice and flour. The global chocolate industry, too, seems to be melting. Pork cow bean harvests in West Africa, because of El Nino and the dry weather it brought, have been affecting crops and driving up prices. The cost of cacao has, in fact, tripled to the tune of more than $10,000 per tonne, forcing Swiss chocolatier giants like Lindt to decide between raising prices and losing money to keep customers. And that price is only set to rise more after major producer Ivory Coast raised the price of the cacao it sells by 50%. There's more than one way to look at the industry that brings you bonbons, candy bars, and raw protein powders. But the economics and environmental impact of chocolate production are bound together with bitter results. We have seen that the price has tripled in one year. It's due to a very bad record l'année dernière dans les deux pays principaux de la production des fleurs de cacao, donc au Ghana et dans la Côte d'Ivoire. Et ces mauvaises récoltes sont dues à la, au changement climatique. Climate's contribution a vicious cycle of deforestation in Côte d'Ivoire and Ghana, according to the National Wildlife Federation. They've lost 94 and 80 percent of their natural forests, respectively, and a third of this loss is due to monoculture, or one-plant cacao farming. Deforestation disrupts local weather patterns and contributes to global warming, worsening heat waves and droughts. These make farmland unsuitable for growing, forcing farmers to expand into new areas, starting the cycle again. Cacao farmers have already noticed the changes, and large-scale producers like Mondelez estimate these regions may no longer be suitable for cacao farming in the next 30 years. But a sustainable approach is financially friendly, too. As one chocolatier in Switzerland's jura vaudois region knows... Ça fait seven ans que je suis en bio et je, je m'y retrouve. Mes prix n'ont pas augmenté depuis 2017, alors qu'on est en 2024. Et euh, bah, je vais continuer sur cette démarche parce que bah, j'estime que euh, voilà, il faut que ça reste aussi abordable pour tous. Et puis euh, c'est aussi euh, important que les gens puissent avoir du chocolat de qualité, euh, le plus pur possible, à un, à un coût tout à fait euh, correct. He's relied on small-scale, organic, local quality production for seven years. Le fait de travailler avec euh, des producteurs locaux en termes de de crème, de beurre, de fleurs, d'œufs, 
euh, les coûts sont largement moins chers en direct qu'avec des intermédiaires comme auparavant euh, je travaille et donc je m'y retrouve vraiment mieux euh, de cette façon là. But if the deforestation continues, the industry's prospects could be as dark as its chocolate. As if cocoa production didn't have enough issues, our global obsession with chocolate is also the driving force behind serious human rights abuses, according to industry watchdogs. Among the worst of these are child labor and slave labor on cacao farms, especially wherever two thirds of the world's cacao is grown, West Africa. What's making children vulnerable to these conditions. Farmers aren't paid well for their cacao and can't pay their workers well and forcing miners to work to make ends meet. But our next guest, Sumaya Taliarkan of the Fair Trade Foundation tells us how consumers can help. It's a great time to think about where our chocolate comes from and what conditions it's grown in and how we can support the cocoa farmers who are growing it. And talk about exactly how uh, you would recommend farmers be supported. I think if we want to support farmers to keep growing cocoa, it needs to be sustainable for them. And what fair trade means is a better deal for farmers. We pay a minimum price for fair trade cocoa, which means that farmers um, can cover their costs. And on top of that, a fair trade premium that they can invest in their communities or their businesses, maybe build schools or hospitals or roads. All of those things make cocoa farming a more positive and sustainable option for them. But I think there's more we can do. And I think, you know, until I started working in GoGo, I just didn't understand what the issues were. But now that I know the reality that faces farmers, I always look for fair trade GoGo because um, in a context, first we had the pandemic, the cost of living crisis, but for farmers, the issues of climate change are really making their livelihoods very, very challenging. So they can't predict when the rains are coming. There have been droughts, there have been floods, there have been diseases like swollen shoot disease in Ghana and supply of cocoa is dropping. So it's very simple for shoppers in the UK. We recommend going out and buying a fair trade egg. It's the simplest change that you can make that will also help the cocoa farmers. Do you find that the people look at the chocolate packaging to see if it's fair trade approved? It's a really good question. I think that's what this campaign is for. It's to encourage people to do that. Um, because what we know is that, for instance, um, half of parents are already talking to their kids about issues like fair trade. So those people must be starting to look for the packaging that we're talking about. I have to ask Sumaya, how much are farmers a part of the environmental problem? And I say this because, for example, in West Africa, there's massive deforestation for cocoa plantations. One of the reasons is that farmers normally, um, they plant more cocoa trees without reusing land. For example, in the uh, Ivory Coast, I believe it is, uh, roughly 70% of deforestation is linked to cocoa farming. So then how does fair trade ensure that the environment is safe while supporting cocoa farmers? Um, some of the programs that we're working with cocoa farmers on include um, taking a dynamic agroforestry approach where they're looking at kind of soil resilience, they're looking at climate smart cocoa, also thinking about uh, income diversification, finding other ways to other products that they can grow. For instance, um, you can cultivate cocoa under shade trees and then you have the income from whatever the tree is producing, as well as from the cocoa. And that also shades the cocoa trees and protects them from climate change. That's one example. We also have a whole lot of um, standards and trainings as well. We have trainings with our colleagues in Côte d'Ivoire and Ghana to raise awareness of the issues around deforestation. Um, we have a new partnership with a, a company called Satelligence, which will support farmer organizations with satellite mapping data so they can start to see what their farms look like and where deforestation is occurring. Can you give an example of um, an incorrect way that farmers say in Ghana were previously conducting, doing business, um, harming the environment, and how that has changed because of their association with fair trade? 
I wouldn't use the word incorrectly, but farmers used, for instance, to use um, slash and burn, where they would burn their crops to the ground. And what they learned through one of the programs that we did uh, it, jointly with the government, in fact, is that rather than slashing and burning, if they um, chop those trees down and use them as mulch and regrow, that's much better. That's a much better approach. Meanwhile, in the West African nation, Senegal, a group of women have their own climate related challenges. It's almost impossible for women to tackle the effects of global warming when they can't own land. This is Mariam Konko. She and others once convinced a landowner to rent them a small plot of land in return for part of their harvest. But they were double crossed. Five years after they made a profitable papaya and grapefruit garden, the owner kicked them off. But their dreams weren't crushed. Mariam is now a president, the president of a 115,000 strong rural women's rights movement called We Are The Solution. It's a great name for an organization keen to combat climate change. And they'll need that resolve. Temperatures in Senegal have been rising 50% more than the global average, according to the UN. And rainfall is predicted to drop by 37% in the coming decades. Les femmes ne sont pas propriétaires de terre, ça c'est la tradition africaine qui le dit. Donc le fait qu'elles ne sont pas propriétaires, elles ne peuvent pas investir pleinement sur la terre qu'elles n'appartiennent pas. Donc aujourd'hui nous vivons depuis des années des femmes qui se regroupent en association et qui demandent euh, de la terre ou bien ils louent. Nous visons trois objectifs. Le premier objectif, c'est vraiment promouvoir les savoirs et savoir-faire paysans qui ont longtemps préservé la souveraineté alimentaire en Afrique. Le deuxième objectif, c'est vraiment euh, influencer les décideurs politiques pour une meilleure ag gouvernance agricole. Le troisième objectif, c'est la valorisation des produits issus de la pratique agroecologique ou l'agriculture familiale. Our friends at REN21 have published another global renewable status report and the International Renewable Energy Network has disappointing findings to share. Primarily that there are finance and infrastructure issues preventing renewables from keeping up with global electricity demands. REN also says barriers like grid limitations and funding constraints are causing some 3,000 gigawatts of renewable projects to stall. Here's more from the company's executive director. Um, I'm curious about one of the stats in the report, which says that uh, a record 473 gigawatts of um, renewable power capacity were added last year in 2023. Um, mm -hmm. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that 473 gigawatts can uh, power about 355 million homes. Um, talk about where on the planet these homes are. <laughs> so I, I guess like the good news when we're looking at this is renewable energy exists everywhere and this is reflected by the fact that uh, almost I think it's uh, 170 countries have renewable energy in their total final energy consumption. Um, now, when we're looking at the investment uh, split, which is another way of looking uh, where renewable energy is happening, we still have a concentration um, in, in China and that has been for many years a leading country. Um, but we also see that uh, there is a very clear early developments, um, important developments in, in the US, uh, in Europe, um, Latin America, and um, also on the, you see like a, everywhere, basically renewable energy is happening. But we clearly have this concentration. Yeah, the report um, also says that low income countries are at a significant disadvantage. Why is that? And is it deliberate? I wouldn't say that it's deliberate. I think a uh, first part is very clearly that in response to um, ultimately, and I think this is what uh, the renewable energy power success story tells us. Um, you mentioned the 473 gigawatt of installed capacity. That's another record year because it shows that the technology exists, works, and if you have the right policy and regulatory frameworks, can thrive. Um, so one aspect is very clearly that um, we need to complement the ambition uh, of government that has been highlighted at COP28, for instance, with a tripling renewable target with the right policy and regulatory frameworks. And this is one of the aspects that any government needs to ensure to create the markets. 
Um, the other aspect, however, and I think this is where we see a lot of pressure during the last um, or in, in 2023 and still existing today, renewable energy is capital intensive in the beginning because you don't have any fuel cost, but you need to invest in the infrastructure in the beginning. And um, as a result of the economic uh, situation and the inflation, um, the cost of capital has increased um, during the last uh, month and is increasing in a dis, uh, yeah, unbalanced way. So when we're looking at solar photovoltaics and wind, for instance, um, in high income countries, we'll have a capital uh, cost of 4%, uh, whereas in developing countries, uh, we'll reach around 10%. And in some countries, it might even reach 20%. And this is indeed where there is an additional pressure um, on the finance side in developing countries. Mm. I'm curious about policies like the U.S.'s uh, Inflation Reduction Act and others in different countries um, that were possibly in implemented after COP28. Uh, can you predict when we'll arrive at this 1,000 gigawatt uh, that's needed annually um, to meet global sustainable development um, goals? So I think this is, a, so when we'll arrive is uh, unfortunately something that really depends on how much action uh, governments are uh, putting into uh, creating the right policy and regulatory framework, but also how much investment is not going only into capacities, but also into infrastructure, because these infrastructure has been identified as a key bottleneck also um, in the uptake. The investment uh, of uh, 2023 um, only represented, not even represented 50% of the investment that is necessary to reach the uh, 2030 targets of tripling renewable energy capacities. And I think this is um, uh, clearly showing um, the, the big pressure we have on mobilizing the finance and creating the right regulatory frameworks. Um can you just list one or two recommendations that REN might have made, REN21 might have made in its report to overcome these financial and infrastructure burdens and challenges? So um, the report is really looking at the status. So there is not directly a recommendation, so to say. But obviously, when you look at the status, you can already say, like, what are what are basically the lessons learned and translate this into recommendations? I think one part is, um, as I mentioned, renewable energy is thriving, especially renewable power, but it's not um, not quick enough to um, basically support the increase in energy demand. So this is already giving one indication, which is um, that. We need to couple renewable energy investment and infrastructure development with energy efficiency measures. And uh, COP clearly had a target here too on doubling energy efficiency efforts. And um, this is something that is really not at the forefront. Another aspect very clearly is um, the fact that renewable energy power has been uh, very successful as a result of policies here. 170 countries have a renewable energy power target. Um, only 90 countries have basically a target, an economy-wide target. And I think a part which is even more critical is when we are looking at uh, when we are looking at the net zero policies, there are net zero policies in 151 countries, but only an economy-wide renewable energy policies in 69 countries. So there is really a disconnect between understanding that decarbonization really means advancing the shift from fossil fuel to renewable energy. So very clearly, another recommendation is learn from the power success stories, apply it to all energy system and the economy um, to ensure that the transition is happening. And the third part, very clearly, um, renewable energy exists everywhere. And this is inspiring because it can create economic opportunities, opportunities for local benefits anywhere in the world. And um, this also means that citizens can benefit from it, cities can benefit, region can benefit. However, to be able to do this, we need to ensure access to the technologies, um, access to skills, and access to finance also from developing countries. And just to mention here, I think in developing countries, development finance is obviously a key lever, 
And um, I think this clearly shows that as a global community and to reach the global targets um, linked to climate, but also sustainable development, uh, we need to address not only the mobilization of finance, but also a distribution to all countries. And that is our show. But before I leave you, here are images of greenhouses. I know they're a pretty ordinary way to grow crops. But in Somalia, which has suffered years of civil war, recurring drought and recent flooding that's led to malnutrition, these greenhouses allow farmers to produce fruit and vegetables all year round, which increase, of course, food security for residents of the capital Mogadishu. <laughs>